How was your week? Had a good one? I hope so. It's the weekend again, so let's review another very interesting research paper. And today we're going to talk about police interrogation. I do have another video discussing police interrogation techniques. I'll link it up so you can give it a quick watch if you're interested. So this 2017 paper was not written to simply list out main police interrogation techniques. Instead, the author set out to explore and discuss why police interrogation techniques are so effective. So very effective, in fact, that sometimes innocent suspects would confess to committing crimes that they didn't actually commit. Confessing to a crime that one did not commit would sound incredible and incomprehensible to many. But as these authors presented in this paper, when we understand how and why these interrogation techniques are so powerful, we begin to understand why false confessions can occur. I will simply list out some of the most interesting points from this paper to share with you. And in doing so, I'm also citing a few related papers for which I will put the references in the video description down below. Now let me do an important disclaimer here. I have tremendous respect for law enforcement. I really do. Police officers are often dispatched to difficult and potentially dangerous situations dealing with difficult people with bad attitudes. Police officers are sent into all sorts of disturbances and situations that you and I probably never want to get involved in. Watch these earlier videos and playlists of mine. Now with all this in mind, with much respect and appreciation for what many police officers do on a daily basis, let's review this study and look at some of the most interesting points from this 2017 paper. First, about police interrogation and false confessions, why is this something that we should talk about? Why is it important and interesting? Well, the authors give a great answer to it. How confessions are secured during police interrogations is a reflection of the kind of society that we live in. Look, I think we can all agree that we do not want to live in a country or a society where police officers can simply beat a confession out of you, where they can physically abuse you and harm you and coerce you until you confess to whatever crime you've been accused of. I think we we can all agree that that is bad and that fair and due process is necessary and good. And this is what the authors of this paper said as well, and I quote, The manner in which confessions are secured can go directly to a society's sense of justice and fairness, as nowhere are positions of power and vulnerability so pronounced as in the interrogation room. And that's very well put. Second, the authors of this paper compared police interrogation to a game, a high-stake game that police officer and the suspect play. These authors, as well as previous researchers, describe police interrogation as a confidence game whose essence is the exchange of trust for hope. And just like any game, there are rules and tricks and techniques and winning and losing involved. Most of the time, it seems, it is the police officer who wins. And the reason for that, according to these authors, the reason is it is the police officer who has all the experiences playing the game, who knows all the rules of the game, and who masters all the tricks of the game. The suspect, on the other hand, probably isn't very experienced, most likely does not know all the rules of this game, and can easily fall for all the tricks. And that is why they lose. Now, of course, most of the time it is a good thing that the suspect loses, you know, when they are guilty of the crime that they have been accused of. However, there are also numerous well-documented cases of high-stake false confessions. Next point, let's take a look at the research methodology of this paper. The authors analyzed actual police interrogations across a number of states involving a wide range of crimes, all of which were felonies. In total, 32 interrogations were analyzed. Some were on tape, some were in the form of transcripts. In some of the cases, the suspect was found guilty or pled guilty, but were later exonerated. I should also note here that this paper has three authors, and one of the three authors worked for over 20 years as a police detective in a major metropolitan area in the United States. Number four. So now let's take a look at the findings. The authors first talk about the opening move of this game, rapport building. This is where the police officer opens the interrogation. Rapport building is usually quite relaxed, pleasant, and social. So I'll pretend to be a police officer and you will pretend to be a suspect. So as a police officer at this stage, I'm going to be very pleasant and nice with the suspect. I would typically ask simple, informal, social questions which are easy to answer and which have nothing to do with the case. It's just small talk, nice and easy. It is also common that I would offer you drinks and food and other items for comfort at this point. It is also common that I would explain procedural things in a very relaxed manner just to get you comfortable talking to me. 
The conversation we have during this report building stage would typically follow social conversational norms. We would take turns to speak. I ask an easy question, you give an answer. I ask another question, you comment again. Most likely, there are no interruptions. I'm not going to interrupt you when you speak. I will not ask any challenging follow-up questions. I will not disagree with you. I will not challenge you or rebuff you in any way. I'm going to agree with your answers because I want you to feel comfortable talking to me. I want you to like me and trust me. I want you to want to talk to me. In fact, a good police interrogator at this stage would come across as a genuinely nice, caring, and hospitable person because that is how we can get the suspect to talk to us. As such, rapport building serves several purposes. What I want to do is I want to elicit a sense of collaboration. I want you to believe that I am genuinely here to help you. I want you to feel that this is a safe place and you can talk to me in a relaxed and safe manner. Just like the little social conversation we've been having, nice and easy. I want to place you subconsciously in a position where your role is to answer my questions. I'm the one who's asking the questions and you're the one who's answering them. I also want to establish a behavioral baseline. I want to see what you are like when you are answering questions normally and truthfully so that I will know when you are not being truthful later on in the real interrogation. And of course, most importantly, before we start to talk about the case, I want you to waive your rights. And most likely you will waive your rights because now you believe that I am really here to help you. You trust me, you like me, you feel you can depend on me because I am here to help you get out of this mess. Now, you want to tell me what happened? Good. You're being very wise. I'm glad you want to tell me your side of the story. Now, let's fit out this form first. There you go. Now the suspect has waived their rights. The report building stage is completed. So these are some of the things that the authors of this paper highlighted regarding the opening move of report building. And they provided multiple examples and quotes from the interrogations that they analyzed. Number five, now that the rapport building stage is over and the suspect has waived their rights, the real interrogation begins. In some cases, there might be the need to change the tone of the conversation. During rapport building, I was very pleasant and social. I was very nice. I was not threatening in any way at all. But now, there may be the need for me to change my tone to be more aggressive, adversarial, accusatorial, and confrontational. Here, this paper gives a lot of examples, and I'm going to focus on just a few things. One interesting aspect that this paper discussed in detail is the use of interruptions and rebuffs. If the suspect is telling us something which we do not want to hear, if they're saying something which is not in line with the official version of the story, we need to interrupt them immediately. We need to say something like this. No, 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 no. That's not what happened. Stop lying to me. You are a liar. You are lying to me. Stop that. Now, if the suspect says something like, I don't remember, I can't recall, we need to put a stop to that as well. Say something like this. Stop telling me that you don't remember. You do remember. You remember everything else which happened that day, so how can you not remember this? You do remember this. Tell me exactly what happened. And if the suspect still says that they don't remember, well, we can push back harder. Now, stop talking to me like I am stupid. Don't you ever tell me that you don't remember, because you know what? Every time you say that, every time you say you don't remember something, that tells me exactly what you're hiding. So essentially, every time the suspect says something which is not what we're looking for, we need to stop them. We need to interrupt them and continuously rebuff them. And remember the good cop, bad cop routine? You don't need two people to utilize that technique. You can play both roles yourself. You can push and push and push the suspect into a corner and then you comfort them. And then you do it again and again. You push them, you comfort them. You call them a liar, everything they say is a lie, and then you put on your comforting face and be nice to them. Soon, the suspect will be very angry, upset, emotional, anxious, sad, dejected. Ultimately, they're going to feel hopeless. And that is good, because sooner or later, they will be so emotionally drained and exhausted that they will feel that there is no other option but to confess. They will tell you exactly what you want to hear. And that's how we get our incriminating statements and or confessions. And if at any point the suspect indicates that they would like to somehow stop the interrogation process, what do we do? Well, we should indicate to them or suggest to them that we can and we will stop this interrogation if they tell us what we want to hear. We could say something like this. You want to stop all this? All right, I can stop this. I can make all of this go away as soon as you come clean. Because we want to build into the perception of the suspect that in the interrogation room, in this context, confession is the only way to end the game and to get out. You don't get to quit playing this game. This game is only over when I say it's over. Now, of course, not all interrogations would go exactly like this, exactly like how I described it. Some interrogations may be very pleasant and collaborative throughout, whereas others might be a bit more adversarial and accusatorial. As the authors of this paper note, even among the 32 interrogations that they analyzed in this study, there is much variance. 
The author state, there is no one kind of interrogation, no singular set of rules. Outside legal requirements of proper conduct, there is a lot of room for investigators to maneuver. So what is a by-the-book interrogation? Well, that is really hard to say because one interrogation can be very different from the next, depending on the case, the crime, the officer, and the suspect. Taken together, the interrogation process tends to reflect a substantial power disparity between the interrogator and the suspect. This power imbalance is noted by this paper as well as many other research studies. I mean, think about it. In the interrogation process, which these authors liken to a game, one party is very experienced and knows all the rules and all the tricks. The other party is inexperienced and does not even fully understand the rules and the tricks and the techniques. One party can legally lie to the other party and use deception and deceptive techniques. They can interrupt you whenever they want. They can call you a liar if they want. They can give you false promises of leniency. They can bluff and rebuff all they want. They can use false evidence ploys. They can tell you things which are simply untrue true and that's not a problem. Whereas you, if you say something that is untrue during the interrogation, in most cases that statement would be admissible in court and likely be viewed as incriminating. And that is why these authors said, and I quote again, the manner in which confessions are secured can go directly to a society's sense of justice and fairness as nowhere are positions of power and vulnerability so pronounced as in the interrogation room. Ending the paper, the authors put forth a number of potential suggestions regarding, for example, how the Miranda warning should be rephrased and given differently, and how the roles played by the judge and the attorney should be adjusted. And let's remember, one of the authors of this paper was a former police detective who worked in the field for more than 20 years, which adds quite a bit of weight to the message here. So this is a fascinating paper and I very much enjoyed reading it. In making this video, I also used some information from a few other research papers, which I will link up on the screen or put them in the description down below. There are several other related papers that I recently read about police interrogation versus military intelligence interrogations, about the use of false evidence ploys, about false confessions. So if you're interested in all these topics, please stay tuned. We're gonna review all these papers in the coming weeks and months. Have a good week and I'll see you next weekend.